everyone. We're going to start, even though people are still um, coming in. Um, we're on a tight time frame, so I have a few opening remarks, but I'm going to speed them up and speak fast, so it'll be sort of like a uh, 45 RPM record for anybody who's old enough, and there's very few people here who are old enough to remember, but it's, I'm going to be like 45 played on 78 um, for, <laughs> for a few minutes. Um, thank you so much for coming. My name is uh, Bob Herbert. I'm a, um, well, actually, the, I'm a distinguished senior fellow at uh, Demos in New York. I think the Demos is a reference to the fact that I'm old, but, uh, but I am a distinguished senior fellow at Demos, and Demos is a wonderful think tank in New York that is supporting my work now. And for a, a long time, um, I was a uh, columnist for the New York Times and a longtime journalist before that, more years than I want to remember. Um, so I'm going to do a brief. Uh, um, few brief opening remarks. I'll introduce the panel. The panel and I will have a discussion for a little while, and then we'll open it to the floor uh, for Q&A. Um, as I travel the country in the midst of <clears throat> the jobs crisis, which I think is the most serious problem facing the U.S. today, I see enormous numbers of young people whose access to the highways of opportunity are blocked, or who face such an uphill struggle the odds are against them succeeding. We're failing those youngsters. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do here in the brief time we have this morning is to get a sense of why we're having such a hard time putting all of America's children into the fast lanes of opportunity that past generations, like the one that I grew up in, had so long relied upon. Uh, I don't just mean financial opportunity. I think there's almost too much stress put on the dollars aspect of uh, this. I mean giving all of our young people a real chance to live richer lives intellectually, socially, artistically, and in many other ways. Uh, education is not the only key, but it's certainly one of the most important keys to unlocking access to that kind of robust, exciting, and ultimately satisfying life experience that I'm talking about. America once led all other nations in educating its young people. We set the standards right here in the United States. In their important book, The Race Between Education and Technology, Claudia Golden and Lawrence Katz said, this is a quote, because the American people were the most educated in the world, they were in the best position to invent, be entrepreneurial, and produce the goods and services we needed using advanced technologies. I personally remember how the arts were flourishing in America when I was a child. Jazz, rock and roll, Broadway theater, abstract expressionism and painting, and on and on. That all went hand in hand with the education of our population. And then for some reason, we foolishly applied the brakes. An advancement slowed considerably for young adults beginning in the 1970s and for the overall labor force by the early 1980s. We fell back in terms of educating our population. So what happened and how do we get our education mojo back? Um, we have with us a Cracker Jack panel of really smart people here today to help us with those questions. I'm writing a book and I need to talk to as many smart people as I can. <laughs> <laughs> These folks are engaged in the real world rough and tumble of education in America and that practical experience will keep us from getting bogged down in arcane theories and rigid ideologies, there will be none of that permitted today. Today will be about plain speaking, so let's get started. I am delighted that we are being joined by, I'm gonna start this way and go that way, right, right to right. Um, <laughs> Wendy Kopp is the founder and CEO of Teach for America. Under her leadership, Teach for America has nearly 33,000 participants. You have to correct me if I get the numbers wrong. Have reached more than three million. Incredible, isn't it? Have reached more than three million children nationwide during their two-year uh, teaching commitments. Ms. Kopp is also the CEO and founder of Teach for All, a global network of independent social enterprises that are working to expand educational opportunity. John Pepper is the chairman of the board of the Walt Disney Company and the co-chairman and former CEO of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. He has also served as Vice President of Finance and Administration at Yale University and is Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Board of Directors of the Procter & Gamble Company. 
Uh, Jasmine Torres is with us to keep us honest. She is a student at the University of Southern California. You talk about being in the real world of education. Jasmine is there. Um, we don't need to talk about what Southern Cal did to Notre Dame. That's not going to be permitted either. <laughs> Dr. Harry L. Williams is the president of Delaware State University, where he has previously served as provost and vice president of academic affairs. Under his leadership, the university has established a new general education program, a distance education strategic plan, and a middle states monitoring report plan. And um, at the end, Robert Balfant, did I pronounce that right? Yep, thank you. <laughs> He's a research scientist at the Center of Social Organization of Schools at Johns Hopkins University. He's also the Associate Director of the Talent Development Middle and High School Project, which works with more than 100 high poverty secondary schools to develop and implement reforms. He is a leading researcher on the dropout crisis, which we'll also be talking about today. So the first question is a big one. Uh, I'm going to have to ask our panelists, I, I hate to do that, but we're going to have to keep our answers relatively short because of the time squeeze we're on. But the first question is a, is a big one, and I'll allow a little bit more time. And then are, what are a couple of things that we absolutely have to do in the next couple of years, next five years or so, more than a couple of years, you can't turn around that fast, to expand access to high quality education in the United States and improve the education environment so that the youngsters, even if they have access, actually follow through and complete their uh, studies. And uh, why don't we um, start uh, down on the um, end with Bob, and uh, especially since you've done so much work on the dropout crisis. What are a couple of things we need to do? Sure. So um, really, there's uh, three interrelated pieces to this. First, to recognize that the dropout crisis is solvable. We know which schools produce the dropouts. Within them, the kids identify themselves. They wave their hands and say, I'm in trouble. We just have to respond to the signals. So the truth is that sitting here today, we pretty much know who absent intervention is going to drop out in the next decade. So it's really our obligation to go get them and stop it. Um, and it's only a subset of schools. There's good data coming out this year for the first time we're measuring graduation rates the same way across the nation. So every community can actually map within their community to the kid where the dropouts come from and recognize the early warning signs of attendance and their behavior and course performance. Let us know from the sixth grade forward, the kids are signaling we have to mobilize against it and really do it at a community level. Um, second, we have to recognize that real pathways from poverty to post-secondary success. We've got to build signals at all the key junctures that effort actually leads to success. That's the bedrock of the American dream. You work hard, good things happen. And high poverty communities lived experiences that life is capricious. Sometimes hard work pays off, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes things happen for unexplained reasons and unexpectedly. And so within the educational system, we have to reinforce that effort leads to success. So here's an idea that came from one of my students, maybe the, the next Teach for America generation, um, which was it should be the norm within five years that every eighth grader can get high school credit in eighth grade as a norm. That every senior in high school can get college credit as the norm, both AP but also from local colleges and local colleges teaching classes in the high school with the, with the idea we t they teach it to their standards that if you pass the course, that should be the biggest factor in getting admission to that local university because you proved you could do the work at their level. And then if we do that, we could actually make college for many kids be a three-year residential option which let us enhance financial aid and then in return for the enhanced financial aid, ask them to give a year of national service back in the educational pipeline to become the, step, the, the, the stewards and shepherds of the next generation. Because it is a people power issue. We have a million kids dropping out every year. A million kids need someone on their side, nagging and nurturing them and helping them along. To get people power, we have to, have to ask the people we helped along to reinvest and spend the time doing it. And finally, we've got to get the cash flow right. Very prosaic. We know prevention works. There's no money in prevention. We have to beg, borrow, and steal. Right? We spend all the money in the back end in the juvenile justice, foster care, health system, and get no returns. In big cities, anyone in foster care, abused and neglected, uh, juvenile justice have 80% dropout rates. Those are total system failures. Yet we spend enormous sums for failure. We have to get our friends, the, fin the financiers here, to get social impact bonds right, so we get the upfront capital to start the prevention, and it will pay for itself over time. Thank you. Nagging and nurturing. I like it. <laughs> Go for it. Good morning. Um, I'm going to take it from a different perspective and look at it from a higher ed perspective. 
Uh, here in our country, we are struggling in terms of trying to compete and improve the number of students graduating from college. And one of the major issues centers around uh, retention. And retention is big, uh, spe specifically with first generation students. Uh, Delaware State University is a historically black college and university. Uh, there are currently 105 HBCUs in America. Uh, we are an 1890 land grant institution, meaning that we, were, uh, we have federal support and there are only 18 1890 uh, HBCUs in America. And what we serve in terms of the students we serve are first generation students. Uh, about 85% of our students uh, will be the first one in their family to graduate from college. Uh, we have people coming through our institutions with, without a clue in terms of the process of how to navigate this, this maze of financial aid uh, and how to navigate this process of trying to secure the resources for students to, to attend. Uh, at our institution, our students, uh, the per family income is about $40,000. And you can do the math. At the this institution, the cost to attend is about $25,000. So you're asking someone to come up with $40,000 and how they're gonna find those resources. But I want you to know that families will, be in, will do everything to get them through that first year because they want you to realize your dream to go to college and then they believe and hope that the institution will provide the resources to keep you there because you're gonna make good grades and you're gonna excel. Well, we're struggling and what we, we see and what we have done to address this particular issue uh, at our particular institutions is something that I think uh, will happen all over the country. We're looking at uh, working with our corporate partners and identifying resources to support institutions where they can improve their retention and graduation numbers. Because these students, uh, they can be successful and they want to be successful. But we have to put the resources there to support them and put the initiative there. One reason why Delaware State was uh, asked to be a part of this our governor made it very clear to everybody in the state that higher education is important. If you look at all the states, you have the support of the local uh, delegations in terms of the state officials. That's a good sign. That's a good sign in terms of the value of higher education. But those states that what they're cutting higher ed, those states are struggling. And we, we have been very fortunate uh, that our state legislators saw the value to invest in students and to invest in their education. This year, the State Assembly approved a scholarship program called Inspire. And if you go to Delaware Online this morning, there's a front page news story talking about the impact of this particular scholarship program. This program will provide uh, students from Delaware an education up to $3,000 to attend. Our in-state, this is the first year doing this program, the in-state uh, application and in-state enrollment increased 44%. 44% in one year. That's because people realize you can go and get an education, but you have to have the dollars to support. Part of this process, this scholarship program, we also added a component for community service because we want students to realize that scholarships are not free. You have to give back to your community. So part of our effort, we're gonna have a day of service in the whole entire state of Delaware. The whole entire state. We only have three counties in the state, but the whole state. <laughs> We're going to cover the whole state, and we'll have students all over the state and so they can see the value of their tax dollars coming back. So I see education, I see retention play a major role in terms of supporting, trying to turn things around so that we can become number one again in this nation in terms of producing students with degrees. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, I know that, uh, or I'm sure, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that um, you and your relatives, your friends, fellow students, no youngsters who have uh, fallen by the wayside, have dropped out of school, or youngsters who, for financial reasons or otherwise, do not have easy access to higher education, and youngsters who um, struggle, as there are always some youngsters struggling, to get through, say, four years of college. If you could, um, if you could think of uh, one or two things that you think would help make this, pro would help improve this process, what would you tell us? Can you guys hear me okay? No. Okay, just you, because they, You can borrow my phone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I would like to address it, of course, from a student's perspective, not only as a college student, but also as a student that was considered at risk. Um, I'm a Hispanic female. Um, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. 
And um, I was homeless during my years of high school, um, moving from homeless shelters to group homes. Um, and that was very difficult, knowing that there was lots of statistics already against um, my educational success. Now, what I think needs to happen is that, um, I don't think this down, I have notes. Um, college uh, readiness needs to begin in early education. Um, I didn't live in foster homes my whole life, but when I did it become homeless at 13 years old, I knew and I remembered educators in the third grade and the fourth grade who told me I was smart. Um, they, who told me that I could go to college and that I could do something. So when it, when it took time, when, when it was my time, I guess, to face that adversity, I was a little bit more prepared because at least I knew that I had an opportunity that I could have and that it was attainable. So I think that college readiness needs to begin earlier in school. It needs to be, it needs to be pivotal, especially in elementary school, because we begin focusing on it once students get to high school, but by the time they get to ninth, 10th grade, 11th grade, some students don't even know about their A through G requirements. They don't know how to apply to community colleges. So I think that we really need to pave the way for them since the beginning and that the educational system needs to work together. Um, I think we also need to shift our thinking. I mean, we all know about the no child left behind. Um, I don't want to get into that, the no child left behind. But even in our wording, the no child left behind. Why couldn't have been called every child for success? We need to have words that empower youth, that say you can do it, not that paint a negative picture. When I think of no child left behind, I think of like kids running, like trying to like hold on to something. But when I hear every child for success, that makes me feel all good inside, you know? So I think that that's um, important and, and also, um, High schools uh, here in New York or in Los Angeles and big cities, high schools are overcrowded and we only have one, two college counselors and there aren't very many career counselors. And sometimes students think that college is only about becoming a lawyer, a doctor, or a business executive. So I think that they need to be more aware of their options and that we need to bridge the gap between A and B because we tell them that they should go to college and we tell them that that's something they need to do, but we don't provide them with the resources. So I think we need to bridge the gap and we need to not only tell them, but provide them the resources, whether it be phone numbers, career fairs, college fairs, so that they can get access to it. Because if they don't have access to it, it doesn't matter how many times we tell them, it's going to be very, very difficult for them to get there. So the, the high schools, I think, and, and even in middle schools, I think need to, um, have that component of access and information available to them. Great, thank you so much. If I have a run for office, man, I want her as my campaign manager. <laughs> John, go ahead. All right, I, uh, I became involved in education, really the biggest thing outside my career, my family, two years after the um, Nation at Risk report was made in 1983. And uh, of course, that was before um, we had China Southeast Asia and other countries uh, bringing billions of people, fortunately, really for the world, into the competitive environment. So if we were at risk then, we we're at much greater risk today in any regional, despite marvelous things that have happened, no probably more singularly visible and important than what Wendy Kopp has done in improving what we all know to be the most important thing that one could do, and that's the teacher in the classroom, perhaps with the principal creating an empowerment uh, the situation I won't dwell on, you all know it, and I'm glad to see the young people here can continue to work on this with passion. Uh, but we still have a dropout rate of 25%, and 40% of dropouts are either idle or not in school. And I could go on, we have in Cincinnati, I suspect it's mainly true, 40%, 45% of all the children come to kindergarten unprepared, way behind, two years behind um, uh, children from higher income problems. The problems are multiple, and I'll just address myself very briefly to the most promising thing uh, that I've seen having worked in this field for almost 30 years. Uh, and that is the creation of a community-based coalition way beyond its effectiveness that I've ever seen before. Anchored in the United Way, here to the very simple proposition that we are going to work and have every child, every step of the way from cradle to career, get the education they need. And the strategic elements in this that are distinctive and important is that it is at the table are the most important people from the community, all the university presidents, these community college presidents, key business leaders, the United Way, 
through the K through 12 school systems, the funders, all together, eight key goals have been described, key measures, kindergarten readiness, fourth grade proficiency in reading, eighth grade proficiency in math, I won't go through them all, the graduation rates, number entering college, number staying in college, number getting into careers, concrete task forces on every one of them, up and running for four to five years. You can, run, you can learn about it on the web at strivepartnership.org. There are no magic bullets. There's going to have to be multiple things. This is a generational issue, but we have to start working on it today. We talk about jobs. This has everything to do with jobs. We talk about the increasing gap between the haves and have-nots. What we're talking about has everything to do with that. We talk about just every person being able to use his or her God-given ability. This has everything to do with that. It is the biggest challenge we face, and I'll stop just by emphasizing to me the absolute predicate, and that is we have to do the right thing for children right from birth. We cannot have what's going on at zero to five today to continue. We're in Cincinnati, and I doubt if it would be much different in your city. We have programs that work. They're not perfect, but they work. They reduce infant mortality by 90%. They have kids that are on development path, and yet we are only able to afford to give it to 20, 25% of the families that need it, and the number getting it today are less than we're getting it two years ago because of government cutbacks. This, folks, is a huge issue. The two biggest people ask me, do you worry about this country? I say I do, but I see great opportunity, great entrepreneurialism, capital markets are better than any other place, but if we don't confront the gap in our generations between people who have a lot of money and don't, and if we don't support the development of kids so they can start strong and then continue all the way through with the kind of things we're talking about here, we're never going to get at this issue. And we can. But it's going to take will, it's going to take staying power, it's going to take leadership. Thank you. Um, Wendy. Um, so let, let me start with a quick story. Uh, Houston, Texas, low-income kids, 7% of low-income kids in Houston will graduate from college, which, you know, 8% of our low-income, 16 million low-income kids will graduate from college across the country. Um, but in Houston, there's a network of um, middle schools and high schools, charter schools, called the Yes College Prep Network, and when they open their fifth high school in 2014, they will double the number of college-going kids um, in, in, served by the Houston Independent School District. And so I spent a good amount of time with Chris Barbic, who started Yes College Prep, to try to understand you know, what's going on that's different there. They're sending 90% of their incoming fifth graders to four-year colleges. Um, and he was trying to explain his viewpoint on what it is, like, why does he get one set of results and the rest of HISD gets a totally different set of results? And he said, you know, probably I was most vividly struck with the essence of the answer um, one year when I could see firsthand the difference between our schools and, and the regular schools because we were housed on the fourth floor of a Houston Independent School District high school. And he said I would walk through the first floor to get to the staircase to walk up to the fourth floor and I would look in all the rooms as I would walk through. And I wouldn't see chaos in the rooms, but I would look in all the rooms and I would just see a lot of, not a lot, not a lot going on. And then you get to the fourth floor and you feel like this is like a presidential campaign or something. It's like the level of energy, you know? And what he was trying to bring to life is the difference is the purpose of the school on the fourth floor. Like, that school has embraced a very different mission than most of our schools embrace. You know, most schools in America have the mission of putting learning opportunities in front of kids. And they're assuming that some kids are gonna really get it, and some kids are gonna sorta get it, and other kids, you know, might not get it. But, and, and that works in a place where there are lots of safety nets around kids. It worked in the community where I grew up, it worked fine. We all went to college because, you know, we have every privilege you can imagine surrounding us, um, literally 97% of us. But if you took the high school I went to and you put it in Houston, 
in a low-income community where kids are facing every challenge under the sun, inconceivable challenges to many people, maybe not to you, but then that doesn't work. And so what this school and the set of schools that Chris Barbick started and now actually hundreds of schools across the country have figured out is, you know, we can pull this off if we embrace a different mission. If we say our mission is to put our kids to and through college, and then if we go after, like recognizing the magnitude of that goal, that is a very ambitious goal, so we're gonna go after it. We're gonna go after it with the same level of energy and discipline and using the same strategies that the most effective organizations anywhere use. We're gonna obsess around the teams we build, the culture we build, we're gonna manage aggressively, and we are in the end going to do whatever it takes. So when we realize our kids are facing extra challenges, we're gonna find extra supports. When we realize we need more time with our kids, we're gonna lengthen the school day. So at its essence, that's what I think we need to do. Um, you know, I think what we've learned, it, we've spent, as Mr. Pepper has seen firsthand, you know, for longer than I have, billions of dollars of philanthropy we've had Many committed political leaders try to move the needle against this problem, and honestly, for 20 years since I've been in it, we have not moved the needle. The 16 million kids who are growing up below the poverty line still, by the half of them, will not make it through high school. The half who do will have an eighth grade skill level. So if you're a smart kid, you realize even staying in high school, where is it gonna get me? Because you are surrounded by evidence that unless you're a very rare person who beats the odds, it's not gonna make a difference in your lives. And what we've learned, though, in the last 20 years, even though we still have to figure out how to move the needle on an aggregate sense, is we've actually learned that it is possible not just to affect incremental progress, but to affect transformational progress for kids. Like, you can see when you spend time in the Yes College preps of the world that it is possible to actually meaningfully change this for kids. And I think the biggest thing we need to do is realize that because most of our efforts are about incremental progress. You still read all the studies and people are arguing about, well, should we give parents vouchers or not? We should clearly because, you know, very contested studies, but when you give parents vouchers, 33% of the kids, instead of 31%, meet the state standards. Unfortunately, in a world where we're sending, in many cases, more African-American kids into the prison system than through college, we're gonna be, we are, we are all gonna be gone by the time that incremental change matters. So, but what these schools are showing us is it's possible. So we need to ground everything we do in the lessons learned in those schools and reshape our policy context and everything else to get to the point where it's possible to actually grow those numbers of schools dramatically. And, and I think in the end, it's gonna take a lot of things. Personally, I think, the single most important factor in being able to get there is actually leadership. It's leadership capacity, and it's both inside the system, it's in the political system, it's across our civic leadership. M the things I'm talking about, which I could go on about for another, you know, and I'll <laughs> shut up very soon, but very few people understand this stuff. And so, of course, they're not gonna affect the right policies, changes, and they're not gonna know what to do with the jobs once they get them in the positions of leadership inside the education system. And so we need a, to grow the force of people who know what is possible. Um, I, I think that's the biggest lever in all of this. All right, thanks. So, um, so that we do have time to get Q&A with the audience, I'm gonna ask uh, one final question here and, and, the, and the answers are gonna have to kind of be quick. Wendy anticipated a, a little bit. Opportunity Nation defines itself as an um, optimistic uh, effort. And I remember um, when I was a reporter at the Daily News, you know, you <coughs> go up to the, um, to the city editor and you try to sell him a story. And um, news is always about bad news if you're a journalist. And um, so you tell, you'd start to tell a story and he'd just look up at you and growl how many did. And if you could tell him that five people were dead, no matter what the story was, well then he would be interested. If it was three, he'd be less interested. If it was one, he would wonder, why are you even bothering uh, him? So um, I want to get out of that <laughs> mode. Um, and um, I want to see 
why we should be optimistic. So I want the panelists to give us a little bit of a pep talk here as we're about to wrap this up. And I think that um, Teach for America, uh, by definition, is optimistic. I mean, you know, I, I, just, I just love the whole idea of these young people going out there into the world and doing what we, what we know they do. So I'm going to start uh, with Wendy. And you guys give us a little brief pep talk. Why should we be optimistic, or is there any reason to be optimistic about moving forward in terms of education? we should be absolutely, unbelievably optimistic. Oh First of all, 20 years ago when I got into this, there were maybe one or two whole schools that were accomplishing what now three or 400 whole schools are doing. And those one or two schools, Marva Collins School in, in Chicago, we attributed those to the charisma of the school leaders. We didn't think we could replicate that. So we have learned and now have proof points all over the country that it is possible to have whole schools that are doubling, tripling, quadrupling, and more college graduation rates. And that's one reason we should be optimistic. We've learned a ton. We know how to actually do this for kids. So now it's a different question than we were asking 20 years ago. Very different. How do we scale this? Um, secondly, I think we're beginning to see in some communities, because, okay, so the question is, and the real, million dollar question like and billion dollar question can we get to the point where we have whole systems of transformational schools we still don't we can't definitively say yes we know we can do it but some communities are giving us I think reason for optimism New Orleans we have doubled the percentage of kids who are proficient based on the state exams we have a lot more to do but we <laughs> to say that we've doubled the percentage of kids who are proficient based on those tests is in four years, shows us we can move systems really, really quickly. In New York, fourth graders in New York are a full year ahead of where they were seven years ago. If you're a parent of a fourth grader, that is meaningful difference. So we have some communities that are actually making it happen on a system-wide level, and, and that's, that's my biggest reason for optimism. When you dive in and say, well, what's going on there? You know, what's different in those communities than what's going on nationally? And honestly, the fundamental difference is there's a constellation of leaders in those two places working from within the system and outside the system who are deeply grounded in the lessons that have been learned in these quote, transformational schools. So while the rest of the country lurches from one silver bullet solution after another, you could name each of the last 20 years, first it was the project-based curriculum, then it was this, then it was that, now it's teachers. Fix the teachers and we'll fix the problem, but we won't. We will have our greatest philanthropists and our greatest political leaders making speeches in four or five years saying, we thought it was teachers, but it turns out. And finally one day people are gonna say, we have to fix the system because it is a very rare person who can overcome a broken school culture and, and school and system. And what they figured out in these two places is we gotta fix the system. And the teachers are critical, but there are a lot of other things that are critical too. There is no one silver bullet solution in this. So I think there's tons of reason for optimism because we've learned a ton and we've built growing levels of leadership capacity to actually scale it up. Uh, one or two more, so any who wants to volunteer? To uh, let me say a quick, sure. quick, very quickly, four or five quick sound bites. One to just confirm what you're seeing. The worst performing public school in Cincinnati six years ago had a dropout rate of 50%. Same students, empowered teachers, and a great principal. The dropout rate now is 5%, and 90% of those same students are going on to secondary education. Uh, the creation of a community-wide network that even goes beyond the school system to a whole community coming together, as I mentioned, is by far the most significant thing that's structural, that's strategic in terms of what it's focused on. One of the things they've created is a social innovation fund. They've raised $9 million in just 12 months from companies and funders to launch new projects for geared at uh, early childhood. Seeing the progress that's been made on crawl, the kindergarten readiness scores in just three years with improvements in that area, going from 45% to 54% of kids still. Our goal is 90% by the year 2020. Couldn't agree more, incremental won't get us there. Thinking incrementally won't get us there. Uh, but I make the point there, it is the whole community with the leadership of the community from every part of it working together and knowing they're gonna be there for 10, 15, or 20 years working this way, that is, that is absolutely essential. 
one piece, we've been so bifurcated in this system, we've had things for zero to three, then we've had Head Start, then you have kindergarten, then you go on, and, and people weren't working together. Uh, uh, yeah. Go, I just want to make two no, points. He took five, one to two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm optimistic because we live in the greatest country in the world. Okay. The greatest country in the world. And because we have young people like Walker Mosley here. Stand up, Walker. I want you to everybody see your red jacket. Walker. <laughs> This is a, a, Walker is working in inner city Miami, uh, diploma now, diplomas now. Walker is the best we have in America. He graduated from one of the top institutions in this country, and he's there giving back. That's why I'm optimistic about what's going to happen here. We're going to turn this thing around. There's no question in my mind that we're going to be successful with this. No question. Thank wow. you. Bob. I'll just say one thing, that uh, we just did a look over the last decade of progress in graduation rates, and we found that we might call incremental national progress really hides the fact that a subset of communities like Cincinnati have made great strides, others have gone backwards, but overall our civic capacity to address this problem has increased exponentially from a decade ago. And we just need to now apply that to what we know works and, uh, and to dig deep and make it happen. Thank you. And Jasmine, keep us honest here now. Is there really any reason to be optimistic or of are we doomed? Um, well, I'm optimistic because, one, everyone in this room is here because we're trying to bring a problem to light and we're all trying to be part of the solution. So I'm optimistic because we're bringing the, we're acknowledging the problem. We're not permitting it, we're not encouraging it. We're saying there's a problem and, and we're trying to create an effective change um, to success and student <coughs> self-sufficiency. It's not just enough getting them through high school but college. And, and that effort in itself I think is great and it takes a village to help every individual, especially when they're coming from backgrounds like myself. It took community partnerships, it took mentors, it, it took a shelter, um, food. It took a lot of different people. And even now as I am in college, I have uh, mentors. I still have people guiding me and helping me. And so as much as we can all be part of that village to help one person, now that I'm able to be one person, I can now work towards helping a village and that's what we do when we build leaders we help and we build leaders so they can help more people not just to help themselves but so we can continue the success so i think that we should all leave here and stay optimistic so oh. thank you uh, you guys make it easy <laughs> to be a moderator all right here we go we're going to hear from the floor is that we were given an extra 10 hour. minutes so oh, i thought have, it was an hour they have about 15 to 18 minutes for questions. So folks right. keep their questions brief and we will run the microphone around. Start with you, sir. Yes, Jim Applegate from the Lumina Foundation. And just, we're totally, we're the largest foundation in the country, totally focused on college completion. So that's all we do. Uh, and I guess one, uh, to echo something, we will, the, the community involvement, the strive example, the complete community involvement, employers, political leadership, I think that's the only way public private partnerships. That's the only way this is going to succeed. Monday, we'll announce four-year program, multi-million dollar, in 12 major cities around Latino students and college success. But one population that I haven't heard mentioned at all here is the adults. Uh, and there are 35.8 million adults in the workforce right now with some college and no degree. 40% of them have more than 60 hours of college credit. We have a college dropout problem as well as a high school problem. And there, there are even more adults with only high school. And I just came from Omaha, where the focus in Omaha is on adult basic education and those adults who don't even have high school diplomas. In this country, in the majority of the states, and with the exception of the Latino and African American population, we will not have enough, we, we aren't producing enough, we could, we could take every baby born in the majority of states in this country and put them in a college going camp and let their parents see them on weekends and make sure every one of those babies went to college and got a degree, and we would not be where we need to be in 15 years to have a sustainable economy. So I think we have to have a conversation also from the higher ed side about how we're going to bring those adults back. All right, anybody want to take a comment, uh, have a comment on that? That was the comment. <laughs> I just say that community colleges have a huge role to play, in my opinion here, greatly underused right now, and I think one of the things they can do so very well is bring adults in for training in particular areas. Anybody have a question? Here we go. 
Hi, Randy Schmidt, YWCA USA. Um, first of all, Jasmine, you get big kudos for coming here. As someone who grew up in rural poverty with two alcoholic parents, you are doing it. You are doing it big. You will make it. I promise you it may suck like you've never believed, but you will do it. And I'm going to give you my business card because I want you to <laughs> No, because someday I want you to come to DC. You can't have her. She's managing my campaign. Yeah. <laughs> um, she can go on hiatus. Um, one thing I wanted to um, ask about is college option programs. You touched on it a little bit. Um, the woman from the military touched on it that she had done it. I did it um, when I was in high school. I took two years of, um, I actually did a year of college. It was the best thing ever that I did. And I'm really surprised we don't hear more talk about college option programs. For kids who are high achieving, it allows them to get out of high school, go to college, do it for free. It cuts down the cost of college for kids. For kids who are, sorry, for kids who are abused, it allows them to get out of their families. For kids who are bullied, it allows them to leave abusive or bullying situations in school. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about college option programs and how they can really help um, those kids who are most disadvantaged. Who wants to take a crack at that one? Nobody wants to answer any questions up there. Well, I mean, I'll just uh, the, the, the speak to that a little bit, tease it out some, is that, you know, uh, a colleague of mine said basically in the middle grade is when everyone takes a sabbatical. Kids take a sabbatical, teachers, not much happens in the middle <laughs> grades. There's not much forward movement. So there's a lot of room to sort of, to sort of fast forward the system in a way. That's sort of the argument. If we, if we have middle school kids start doing high school work and college kids, the norm, start doing college work, it gives us many more options for both things like national service and even just shorting the financial aid burden because you've got to cover three years of college and not four. Um, and that's the thing you need to really inspire kids to work hard is to show them a real pathway you come and you, in your senior year and you take these classes, you can earn a half year of college, a year of college, they understand that's like real money, that's real time. Instead of the thing you fight is that like, I have my credits, I'm done. It's November, I'm just hanging out for eight months and actually de-skilling myself. Um, so I really think we need to turn that around. Okay. Next question. Keep, uh, we have to keep I, our questions. I will keep sure. it super okay. brief. Um, Brian Alexander with the Council of Michigan Foundations. My question is, uh, I have the opportunity of working with you grant makers in the state of Michigan. They do needs assessments where they ask actual young people in their communities what are some problems that they're having. And stress has become one of the key issues that young people in communities are having. And so I'm wondering, as we're talking about education, uh, we, we seem to skip over the stress and the strain that young people have when they're trying to acquire educational success. So what are some strategies, strategies that you've seen work and what are some things that you think uh, communities should be doing and not just schools to make sure that young people are receiving the assistance that they need and that we can release some of that strain that pre prevents them from being successful? I think that's a really good question. One, the, uh, the stress that comes with um, a, a really high-powered education and also the stress that's sort of inherent in the economic environment that we're in now. So who wants to take a crack here? I, I take a little shot at that. Coming from a uh, first generation perspective, uh, the stress that a lot of our students, uh, financial literacy and having a clear understanding of the financial process of affording an education, paying for it. And that's a big burden on our students. And we're trying to alleviate that, alleviate that stress by uh, counseling, and providing them with workshops and, and having uh, companies uh, from banks to come in to talk about uh, what will happen if you end up with $100,000 worth of debt and your job that you're trying to get may not pay no more than $40,000, how difficult that can be. So trying to get it early on in the process, working with uh, incoming freshmen. I, I just think we've learned that we can take a lot of these issues on through schools. And when I think about these schools that really are putting their kids on a different trajectory, they are doing it through intensifying support. They are bringing everything from health services and mental health services and all sorts of other things. I mean, they are going the extra mile to give their kids what, what they need. So I think we need to solve lots of problems, but until we don't have to wait for that, like we can do it through education by changing our definition of what should happen in education. Just to build on that, in Cincinnati, about 45 schools, about 25 today have what would be integrated community support centers allied with Children's Hospital, for example, uh, dental support, uh, other things as Wendy is talking about. And, and there is a structure for that. And it's absolutely fundamental that teachers would be the first to say, I think, that if it weren't for that support for kids who have all kinds of issues, 
that can't be taken care of is that support isn't brought there. They can't study. They can't be happy. So some integrated support tied to the schools, physically in the school, with the test doctors coming there is really important. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Christine Breeze with the Jacobs Family Foundation. Uh, downstairs, Stuart uh, asked us to call our electeds and say fix the education system. What specifically are we asking them to do and how will we know, because we're going to turn them out of office if they don't do it, what are we asking them to do? Can you give us a couple of quick <laughs> know, suggestions? Okay. Hold her back. <laughs> I think we need to, I think we've learned that we're not going to do it through federal mandates, so I don't know if they're saying call the people in D.C., but if you're going to call the people in D.C., I think the main message should be thing you need to do is figure out how do you incent and develop local leadership and initiative and commitment. You know, in a world where the response of 37 states to NCLB was to lower their standards, we can complain about the folks in DC, but we should really start worrying about what is happening in our communities and states where that's what we think the thing to do is. So I think this is gonna happen through figuring out how do we build the leadership capacity. Of course, I mean, this is our mission, you know, like how do we enlist our country's future leaders in fighting this fight and give them the foundational experiences necessary so that they know what's possible and know what needs to happen. If I was talking to people in a local community, I would say, I would actually honestly, and, and again, the verdict's still out, who knows, and five years from now, maybe I'll say something different, but I would say, look at New Orleans. They have figured out that this is not about fixing the system. This is about, you know, essentially just asking the question, how do we get as many kids as possible into transformational schools? And what they've done is to say, the school is the unit of change. We are gonna break up the system and essentially push all responsibility out to school principals, hold them accountable for results, but empower them with the flexibility that they need to do what needs to be done for kids. And we're gonna know that that alone isn't gonna do it. We need to make a massive investment on the people side of the equation so that we're recruiting and developing the teachers and the school leaders necessary to actually make that happen. And to see the shift there, to see teachers and principals who were not getting great results five years ago rise into a new occasion because they've figured out the job isn't anymore to check the boxes. Like we have a compliance culture in these systems because we don't trust our educators. That's like overwhelming. So they've freed it up, and, and it's, it's to see the entrepreneurial energy, not just in a few schools, but you could spend days walking from one school to another in New Orleans and realize I put my kid here because it's just a new day. So I, I, I think there are a lot, there's lots in that. I, I would just um, like to echo that comment. I, I, think that, I don't think that the change is gonna come from federal mandates or anything along those lines. But I think it's just so important for people to become more civically engaged. In general, I've been going around the country talking about that. But education is an area where everybody can really participate in making a difference. You know, we want more parental involvement. We want more community involvement. We want to get students uh, in, in, involved. So, yeah, the, the the folks here are you're here. So that shows your commitment to this issue. But get your friends and relatives to get involved. Uh, get them to go to uh, local community board meetings or school board meetings or PTA meetings or whatever. Uh, give a little gentle nudge to a, a, a parent that you know who may not be as involved as he or she, she uh, should be. Just that, that, that more community, more civic engagement will make a heck of a difference here rather than waiting for it to come down from on high in Washington. Thanks, uh, Chris Troy, New York Building Futures. Uh, first of all, book recommendation, David Kirk's Kids First, uh, in many ways reinforces a lot of the collective impact, strive approach, uh, five transformational ideas to change the future of America is the subtitle. Highly recommended. Um, two of the most exciting things to me right now in terms of the systems, uh, effort is the collective impact, things going on in Cincinnati. Big question for me there is how would that work in a city like a New York where you just multiply it times a thousand stakeholders um, who need to be involved. And then second is the newer experiment in terms of really bringing together resources to have systemic impact over a whole school system and just wanted to hear 
some of your feedback. John, you want to start? Well, I'd say right now there are at least a half a dozen, perhaps now even a dozen other cities that the folks in Cincinnati, Knowledge Works, who started this are working. Each one will be different, but each one is molded on the idea of picking a really big goal, which at first glance probably will look impossible, but one that will really make you know you need to go for it, get the right leaders around the table, breaking it down into the increments that show we, you have to work on everything from the very beginning, cradle all the way through and integrate it, and have a leadership behind it. It all gets back to leadership. Uh, I think it will work anywhere. I mean, I think it'll work anywhere. I was on the phone yesterday with a reporter from Milwaukee who was interested in my perspective as a business person. They're adopting a program in Milwaukee. Uh, I put a pin in just one thing that's come up here, and it's very much part of this, and that is uh, the, the, tra the development of principles. As a business person, I've just been shocked at the inadequate training that principals have as they come into the schools I've seen. And I have a limited universe, uh, but I'm so taken by what's happened by a program at the University of Virginia, Darden School, uh, and the Curry School combined um, over the past two years. And we had a total of 25 principals go through who said this was by far the most effective thing they've ever done. And in one year, we are seeing an improvement in the educational outcomes of those schools on two, two magnitudes. It's one to five ratings by the state of Ohio, and they've moved up most of them by two steps. And we've now brought that into Cincinnati in, a, in an academy that was built within STRIVE. One of the initiative focus of STRIVE was, of course, teachers, and we're talking to Teach for America and principals, because it all gets back to people. It all gets back to leadership, and the principals just have not had the training they need. But I think STRIVE will work broadly, and I'd be delighted to talk to you about it if you want. Any other comments? <laughs> Next question. Uh, Bob, we have time for one more question, then we'll uh -oh. take it back to you. And I also just, while I have the mic, want to let folks know that lunch is good. There's a special table set up on this floor where you can grab a lunch and bring it back downstairs with you uh, to the auditorium where there are tables set up for you to enjoy it. But we have time for one more question. Last question better be a good one. Hi. Oh, yeah. Precious. Laura time. Aria from Repair the World. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what schools can do to engage parents, to empower parents to take a greater role in supporting the school and supporting teachers. Excellent question. Who wants to take a shot? I've never seen a successful teacher or a successful school in, in this context, in, in communities where kids are facing many extra challenges that didn't reach out and essentially just engage the parents as partners. Obviously, parents want the best thing for their kids, and um, we've just seen how fundamental that is if we're going to truly get kids invested in, you know, putting forth the incredible effort and energy that needs to be put forth to actually overcome all the challenges and, and get where you need to get. But I, I think it's no more, I mean, you know, you think about what a great teacher does, and they reach out and communicate with the parents and bring them in and say and have very honest conversations with them about where their kids are and where they're trying to get them and what more they need, you know, what kind of support and engagement they need from the parents. And we've just seen that where that's the approach, um, you know, by and large, parents are, are ready and waiting to be supportive. I can't overemphasize the importance of the principal. I've seen schools in the same neighborhood, one principal there, they can't get anybody to show up for anything. New principal comes in who really believes in it, reaches out, gets imaginative in the kind of things that are being hosted there, maybe some food, uh, and all of a sudden you fill the hall up. And, and, and the teacher, as you say, Wendy, the teacher, that's one-on-one. -on -one. That's, I'm really interested in your child. Could we talk about it? It gets back to the principal and teacher, in my experience, and it can change overnight with just the change in the person. But, but the one thing I would add to that is, especially at the high school level, that just as the kids often know this is a pathway to nowhere high school, the parents know too. And if there isn't a real pathway, they're not going to invest in it because the, they, they know there's not some miracle cure. To some, if I show up to one more PTA, it's going to change my kid's life. They know that's not true. And so I think we also have to make it real that we actually are building these true pathways right. to prosperity and out of poverty. And, have, and the, the whole community actually says we're going to have 15 slots for kids in this. We're going to have 20 kids slots for this from this school. And so it's tangible and not just like some miracle will happen if you come to one more meeting. Anyone else? Yeah. Sure. Um, sorry. Um, I agree like on the incentive, if it's possible. Um, what I also just want to bring uh, to light is that 
we sometimes, and, and foster youth is a very underrepresented population all across the United States. Only 20% of foster youth graduate high school. All of them, more majority of them are African American and Latino and only 10% go to college. From those 10%, only 3% will graduate from college. And these students don't have, a lot of them don't have any parental support. They live in group homes. They live in, um, they don't all necessarily live in foster homes where there is a family. And um, I think we all just need to be conscious that there are those students who don't even have the option to have parental involvement. And what do we do in that case? Um, and that's when I really feel that uh, community partnerships and teacher leadership is very pivotal because some students want that parental support but they don't even have that option. Um, so I just kind of wanted to bring, um, bring that, but I think parental involvement, that, that is, um, it is key, but sometimes th that is not an option, so. Uh, Harry, any last word? So okay. I agree with Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank our panelists and everyone here uh, for participating today. It is only through cooperative efforts like this wonderful gathering that Columbia has been kind enough to host here that we're going to make any real headway on these very complex challenges facing our country. So thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the Opportunity Nation. <laughs>